Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Old School. Originally published in 2015, this is the 10th book in the Diary of a Wimpy Kid series. And if I'm doing my math right, this is now the sixth book in the series that I personally have read and reviewed on this channel. And if you've seen my previous reviews, you know that I pretty much give the same review to all the books in this series, uh, except for the first one. I, I thought the first one was absolutely brilliant. Uh, every other book I've read in this series, I felt like the author was running out of ideas a little bit or pushing things a little bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't blame them for running out of ideas. The, the first book was absolutely genius, but I think since then I've gotten the impression that he's just churning out material to keep up with the publisher's demand. Uh, I mean, this, this is the 10th book. Uh, in eight years when it came out. I think the first one was published in 2007. This was the 10th book in 2015. That being said, I, I actually enjoyed this one more than the last several ones I've read. Uh, I, a frequent complaint I make is that um, the books are so far-fetched that uh, it's not funny. I mean, it's so far-fetched that it, it takes me out of the story and it's disconnected from reality and that I, I can just see that the author is making Greg do increasingly cringe things just for a story, even though they strike me as things that nobody in their right mind would do, not even a middle school kid. Um, in the previous books, apart from the first one, Sorry, previous, I guess, meaning the previous books I've read. I, I've, I've been bouncing around the order. Um, but I've been told by some of you on BookTube that uh, the, it wasn't simply the case that the first book was brilliant and then they declined steadily in quality after that. There, Some of you alerted me to the fact that there are some very good books mixed in with the series, uh, even later on in the series. And this one was... All right. I, I mean, it wasn't as funny as the first one. Um, but there was nothing that really annoyed me in it either. Um, I thought for the most part it was pretty funny. Um, like all of the books in the series, it's incredibly readable. Um, once you start reading it, the pages just turn themselves. There were, at times, uh, things in the universe of this book were a little bit zany, but kind of in a good way. And I thought Greg's reaction, at least, to the insanity was um, realistic, even if some of the stuff around him wasn't realistic. But that, that, that's okay. It, it, it's Greg's reaction to stuff which will sell me on the story or not sell me on the story. So in this case, well, maybe I should start at the beginning. Uh, the book opens with uh, Gray, uh, Gray talking about the generational gap between him and his parents, where he is happy just to uh, play video games and be on his phone all day, but his mom is on a real quest to get everyone to unplug for uh, a weekend, and it's a petition his mom is running. Um, I actually have a lot of my own thoughts on digital addiction in society nowadays. Uh, I feel increasingly frustrated by the fact that everywhere I go, everyone is looking at their mobile phones all the time. Um, and I feel like this is something that has really just gotten out of control maybe the past five years or, or less. Uh, there's a theory that the COVID shutdown increased uh, digital uh, addiction within the younger generation, although I, I notice it with people my own age as well. Um, I'm, I'm living out in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, so I don't know if it's better or worse in other parts of the world, but I've been told it's just gotten bad everywhere. This book was published in 2015, which in my memory was before things got really bad. But anyways, um, point being, I, I do have a, my own thoughts on this, but I, I'm not going to I'm not going to go on that rant today, um, in part because 
it's not really an integral part of the book. It's just kind of like the, the, the opening hook to set uh, some storylines in motion. Uh, and secondly, because, well, this, this just isn't really the time or place for it. Um, other than, I, I think, I believe, I forgot to look this up before filming, or I forgot to confirm this before filming, but I think Jeff Kinney... The author of these books is roughly my age, or at least my, my generation. Um, so he he is not um, the same age as his character, obviously, and he did not grow up with uh, people texting on cell phones all the time, everywhere, uh, as they do now. Um, but, you know, he, he's imagining what uh, uh, the thoughts would be of a kid nowadays uh, with his parents complaining about devices all the time. Um, but Greg's parents uh, talk about... Uh, yeah, where is it? Greg's parents talk about how when they were kids, they used to play outside all the time until uh, it was dinner. Yeah. Dad said that when he was growing up in the summertime, kids played outside all day until they got called home for dinner at night. Um, now, this, I think, was actually my dad's generation, you know, the generation that, that grew up in the 1950s. When I was growing up, and again, I think Jeff Kinney is roughly the same age as me, there was a big fear of child abduction. You know, there, there's America's Most Wanted TV show, series, was it America's Most Wanted? What was, what was the TV series on in the 80s that was all about child abduction? I forget. Um, but yeah, there, there was a, a number of well-publicized child abduction cases and uh, people were scared about their kids. And it certainly was, by and large, I mean, maybe it was for some kids, but certainly for a lot of us in that era, it was not the time when uh, we were playing outside all day and got home, called home for dinner at night. Plus, we had video games. I mean, we didn't have uh, cell phones, but we had Nintendo and Atari and stuff like that. So we were we were not plugged in constantly like today's generation is, but we, we did spend a fair amount of time on the couch in front of the TV playing video games. Um, so uh, there's, if you want to nitpick these things, I think there's there's a, a generation being skipped over. There's Greg, who's uh, today's generation, but his parents seem like they grew up in the 50s. I, I suspect Jeff Kinney is just channeling his own memories of, of uh, his, um, his, his, his own dad. And then the gram grandpa, who, who seems like my grandpa, who grew up in the 30s and 40s with, with his old stories about everything. So uh, there's a problem in the timeline there, so to speak. But anyways, that nitpick aside, sorry, I just had to get that out of my system. Um, the mother is on a mission to unplug everything, which she finally succeeds in doing. Uh, Dad suggests to Greg that with everyone outside, because they're unplugged, they should start selling lemonade. Greg tries to do that, but there's a, a kid who gets a better lemonade stand. So eventually they just decide to go sell water down at the park where the volunteers are cleaning up. But the mom doesn't like that idea because she says she, they shouldn't be selling water to the people who are volunteering. They should be helping the volunteers. Then they get roped into helping the volunteers. Uh, then the community service people show up. Uh, and there are all these kids running around causing chaos. Then finally the Girl Scouts show up and start organizing everybody. Um, but it's a little bit too much work and Greg sneaks out, uh, a few other people follow him, uh, Greg, uh, realizes that this isn't a good idea and then he's going back, but then one of the Girl Scouts catches him and blows the whistle and then, then he realizes that he's going to have to make a run for it and, it, you know, it just gets zanier and zanier, uh, and in a way that, you know, probably is not realistic entirely but uh greg's reaction to the zaniness around him uh is good um although if i do have to make a complaint uh i would say that 
all the books I've read apart from the first book don't really have very good setup and payoff. So the, for the, the first book uh, had some very good setup and payoff where things were set up at the beginning of the book and then uh, you forgot about them and then they would suddenly come back for the payoff near the end of the book. There are a few things that the first book did very well with that. Subsequent books have not done very good. Um, so there are a number of things here which get set up, but they don't really seem to have any payoff. Like Greg has a study buddy. Uh, he, he's volunteering to help a younger kid with his homework. It's part of the study buddy. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, yeah. Here it is. So Greg uh, volunteers to be a homework buddy, but then it turns out that the uh, third grader he's tutoring is actually a genius who does all Greg's homework for him. Uh, so Greg actually gets uh, moved up to a higher class. Um, but then that's dropped. Uh, yeah, he, he, here it is. Sorry. He gets moved up to a higher class. Um, he says, well, I'm sure Frey, that's his study buddy, will appreciate having more challenging homework. But he can't be there to help me during tests, so unless I can figure out a way to sneak him into school, I'm never going to pass. Um, but yeah, that, that, that plot line doesn't go anywhere. There, there's uh, a number of other plot lines like that as well. Um, Greg... Uh, pin the whole thing on one of the community service guys uh, for that instance earlier where they were running away from the Girl Scouts. Um, it's kind of maybe paid off when he comes back later to eat his lunch on Greg's car and Greg hides under the dashboard to avoid him. Um, but I, I don't know, that's not a very good payoff for that. Uh, the one thing that does get set off and paid up off nicely is a, a plot thread at the end of the book. Let me see if I can find this. Beware of Silas Scratch. Uh, the Silas Scratch thing does actually have a, a suitable payoff at the end. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a number of things in the first half of the book which don't really seem to have a payoff and um yeah even the there's there's a hard scrabble farm which they go to um and greg uh is initially trying to get out of it um so he tells his friend raleigh that he's not going to um bunk with him because there's all this drama about who's going to bunk with who. Uh, and then later he, uh, he, yeah, and Raleigh is having a, a hard time finding somebody to bunk with. Um, by the end of lunch period, things weren't really looking good for him. I can't worry about Raleigh, though, because I've got my own problems to deal with. And again, this never really gets paid off. At, at the end, he does kind of change his mind at the last minute and go to Hard Scrabble Farm, which was where the whole second half of the book takes place. But there's no consequences for him choosing cabin mates uh, at the last minute. Uh, he just gets put in the cabin with Rowry, uh, sorry, Rowley, anyways, and, and uh, some other kids. Um, there is, um, as is usual in these books, a number of the themes are repeated. For example, uh, in the, in the book I just read a couple days ago, The Third Wheel, which uh, I think was like the seventh book in the series or something, uh, the teachers having nice toilet paper when the kids didn't have very good toilet paper uh, was one of the plot points. Uh, something very similar is, is done here where uh, the, the extra toilet paper was being held in the maintenance shed. And it wasn't the cheap stuff either. So... Um, Yeah, the, 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 these books sometimes do kind of hit the same notes again. But uh, on the whole, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was funny. It was readable. Um, 
wasn't as great as the first one, but but an entirely readable. So there you go. That that's the review.